and nobody's actually allowed to leave, even though it gives you the opportunity to do so. <laughs> so welcome everybody to this, our what, second, second meeting of October, 2021. We have Penny Wire. Is it weird? Wire. No, that's from where I am. Oh, sorry, just kidding. Penny from Texas, who's going to be talking to us about uh, what to do if there happens to be an accident on a motorcycle and what you can do to avoid having that happen. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. We'll get started with the bell if I can. Oh no. All right, well, it's asking me to update, so we might not be getting a bell tonight. Let's see. This only happens I, when I'm recording. Yeah, I, exactly. I got on mine earlier just to make sure it will work, and uh, I updated it. So, <laughs> no, it's not going to work. So, if everybody could just right along with me, go ding. <laughs> there it is. We'll, we'll watch it. There you go. It said ding. You guys just didn't hear it. So welcome everybody. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, I don't really have anything to pass along to the group other than there is a board meeting following this. Um, and that's it. So I will right now, I will open the floor to see if there are any happy bucks that anybody would like to share. Actually, I just wanted to remind you about that membership. Everybody was sent an email. Yes, yeah, and I, thank you, Deb. So I did send in an email to everybody to please um, click the link and use the Google form to approve or disapprove the membership application that was submitted for Omar Bank. Um, you can also, if the link doesn't work or you don't feel comfortable doing that, you can just reply and, and send me your, uh, your response. I would appreciate that. Thanks, Deb. Oh, you're talking happy bucks. We got a good ride in in the Sierras last Saturday. Thank you, Larry, for leading that. Uh, I was so smoked on Sunday after your time. Yeah, it was a good ride. Uh, what, did you get home that night or did you stay in yeah. Auburn? It was an extra four hours getting there and back and the ride in the middle. So, but yeah, cool route. It's fun. Uh, I had a uh, anniversary on Monday. It was uh, number 52. Nice. Congratulations. Happy anniversary, Rob. Thanks. And I, I missed you. I got you, Jerry, in just one second. I missed you when you came in, Quinn, but we have a guest, Quinn Edgecombe. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yes. Hi. I uh, Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. yes. Awesome. Um, uh, my name is Quinn Edgecombe. I'm a part of the Rotary Club of Houston Skyline. Um, I recently met Deborah on the N Polio Now ride, and I've kind of been following um, y'all's club on Facebook. Um, I, I've uh, known Uta for a while, so I don't, I don't think she's on the call tonight, but she's a longtime friend through Ryla. I'm a big uh, part of Ryla uh, locally in District 5890. So, yeah, I've been meaning to join a meeting, and I'm <clears throat> excited to hear the talk tonight. So, glad you did. Welcome. Thanks for party. having me. Of course, anytime. Jerry, did you have a happy book? Yeah, I'm happy that I'm all ready for the marathon this weekend. And are you so, are you already ready? I am ready. Yeah. This week's been a light week. It's been nice not running all those miles. Today I ran only three and a quarter miles, only just a little dinky That's little run. That's nice and run. as of right now, I have $24,040.68 of pledges, that's including the gates matching, or I'm running for $917.58 a mile. That's awesome, Jerry. Congrats. Getting close. If I hit that, if I hit that thousand dollar mark, I figured out if I did the math right, every two steps, I'm vaccinating a child. So, okay, so what, what's your current, your current total nine what? For per mile is nine hundred and seventeen dollars and fifty eight cents. Nice. That's including the two to one matching from Gates Foundation. So I'm at I'm over twenty four thousand right now. That's awesome. Wow. Yeah, I never thought it'd go like that. You didn't really? We all did. No, I never thought it would get up that high. This is cool. That's awesome. Oh, we got. It looks like we got another guest coming in. So I'm going to hold for just one second, Deb, before I turn it back over to you. And we can all just stare awkwardly at Vicky. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be real funny if this isn't actually Vicki McLean. Oh, just Amanda, seen. sir, that's that's without John Cram's double double challenge. Oh, really? 
Okay. Yeah, that'd be that would be another thirty dollars a mile if yeah, I nice. actually took that on. So and I, I'm, I, it's awkward to call someone out who literally just called in. But hi, Vicky, welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight. <laughs> would you like to introduce yourself? Wait, you're on mute. On mute. <laughs> Okay, I'm muted. <laughs> Hi, Vicki, where are you joining us from and how did you find, up, find us? Um, let me kill this directions. Uh, I'm joining you actually from Colorado Springs, but I'm from Houston. I'm traveling right now and I found out from the Houston Area Women Riders, uh, Deb. I saw, saw a flash of her go across. <laughs> She's there. I used to live in Colorado Springs. I love it there this time of year. Good time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, we have an appointment with an RV place, so <laughs> that's why we're stopping, but it's all good. Well, enjoy the stop. <laughs> well, we can have all day tomorrow to play tourists, so that's good. Okay. All right. Uh, hi, Mickey. Do you have any happy bucks to share? Call you out while we, while we get through there? Uh, sorry, no. <laughs> Not at the moment. Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, can okay, I share a happy buck? Yeah, sure. Go ahead, Larry. <clears throat> so I got to brag on my granddaughter. There's an organization uh, that services fast pitch softball that covers the entire country. And every week they pick a player of the week. And my granddaughter in uh, Denver, Colorado was player of the week. She batted 10 for 13 in three games, 10 for 13, scored 10 times. And I don't even remember how many RBIs, but she was the player of the week for the country in fast pitch softball. That's awesome. That's better than the Detroit Tigers all last year. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Last call for happiness. If she, if she has a Lions jer jersey, we could sign her up for the Lions team and improve it. <laughs> There'd be somebody on the other team who just kicks a field goal in the last seconds and wins the game anyway. Uh, all right. Well, like I said, Penny has joined us to, to talk us through some do's and don'ts of writing and what to happen when the unexpected happens. I'm going to turn it over to Deb Teplitz, who's going to introduce her. Well, I think uh, I think Amanda got most of it right then and there. Um, this is Vic, uh, Vicky. I got now I got the name Vicky in my head. Sorry, guys. <laughs> uh, this is Penny Fuller. Penny and I met because she is one of the accident scene management trainers. And I, I know I talked about when I took the program, I was like, wow, I learned a lot. And I invited her to come and speak about accident scene management, and, you know, give a little little chat about that and talk about herself while she's at it. Well, Come hey on. guys, how are y'all doing? Excellent, welcome. Good. good, good. Well, to start out with, yes, I am Penny Fuller. Um, that is my alter ego. My real uh, per persona is Gypsy RN. Um, I always tease about that because at heart, I am a motorcyclist and then I have to put on normal clothes and do the alter ego thing for the day job. Um, the day job is I am an ER and trauma nurse. I have been that for about 25 years. Um, I wanted to do something um, outside of bedside. So I thought about it and I said, you know what, what are my two loves? Motorcycles and medicine. So I started a business that is called Texas Trauma and Lifesaver Training. Um, it is a kind of full encompassing uh, training center, but it is motorcycle centric. So I do teach accident scene management classes. I also teach CPR first aid, uh, BLS. I am an MSF uh, rider coach and am about to go to Harley Davidson's Rider Instructor Academy as well. So I will be doing that very soon. So the goal of the business was to have one training center that kind of uh, did everything. So that being said, like I said, I focus on motorcycles more than anything. And the biggest part of what I do is the accident scene management. Um, this is a program that was started by Road Guardians out of Wisconsin. And I'm not good at sharing stuff. So I'm just gonna give y'all a little, this is Road Guardian and you can find them at roadguardians.org. Vicki was the nurse that started it, and um, it was a way for her to start training the people in her club. 
um, at the time. She got it all accredited and created the accident scene management. So just like I am an independent contractor for American Heart Association, Red Cross, and um, ASHI, I am an independent contractor for accident scene management as well. So Vicki handles all of the booklets and the patches and the accreditation, and I am an instructor for that. So that's the easiest way to explain where I come into that. Um, I am the only active instructor in all of Texas, but it is all over the country. So uh, you don't have to come to Texas to take the class. But what accident scene management is, the class is a fully accredited um, class by the American Nurses Association. It's evidence-based. Um, I use both uh, TCCC, if y'all are uh, military, that is tactical combat casualty care, as well as TNCC, which is trauma nurse core curriculum. Um, evidence-based practice uh, to provide true trauma training. So this goes well beyond first aid and uh, CPR. We actually do not teach CPR in our trauma class because CPR is for cardiac events, cardiac arrest, strokes. When we're talking trauma, right? The idea is that we're gonna keep you from going into a cardiac event because cardiac events and trauma are due to loss of circulation. Loss of circulation is generally because we didn't stop the bleeding fast enough. So the course goes into everything from scene safety to moving the injured, um, controlling major bleeding, including tourniquets, pressure dressing, uh, um, Israeli bandages or emergency bandages. Um, we also do helmet removal. And yes, it is necessary sometimes. We teach you the how, when, and the why that you would have to remove a helmet. Um, we also talk about everything from shock to mechanism of injury, spinal stabilization, um, splinting, all of those kinds of things. Um, I am super passionate about this. Uh, I have, again, I'm a nurse at heart, so I'm a scientist at heart, so everything to me is evidence-based. Um, there are studies out there that say that bystander assistance, specifically in trauma, can reduce morbidity and mortality by up to 4.5%. That goes up exponentially on how well the bystander is trained for trauma. So I have those, um, those articles, if anybody would like those to be able to read them. Um, a lot of my statistics and all of that come out of Texas because obviously that's where I live. Um, but one of the ones that struck me as the, the one of the biggest things is that um, motorcyclists account for only 4% of all vehicles on the road in Texas, 4%, but we're 16% of all vehicle fatalities. That's huge. That's a huge disparity within, you know, what's going on. Now, if we can reduce that by up to, you know, 4% or more, just having, you know, somebody who knows what to do on scene, um, when something like that happens, then that's, you know, we can hopefully uh, stop some of those fatalities. The big thing that accident scene management does is really it increases the effectiveness of EMS. That is our goal, to increase the effectiveness of EMS. And we do that by teaching you what to do the first five to 30 minutes before EMS arrives. You know, we ride in groups, most of us do, most of us ride with, you know, our friends, our husbands, our, you know, whatever. We're going to be the first ones on the scene. If we're not riding in groups, a lot of times we're still the first ones on the scene because we all like to ride the back roads, right? You know, whether it's uh, the hill country here in Texas or the tail of the dragon or the, you know, the million dollar highway or whatever, right? The average response time for EMS in rural areas is greater than 30 minutes. You know, and I know that for like the hill country, sometimes cell phone service is spotty and you're going to have to send somebody to go and call, you know, do you know what to do to stabilize that person until EMS arrives? The best thing to do, the most effective thing to do. So that is really what I teach with all of this. Like 
Deb said she has taken my class. It's a lot of fun. It's not dark and dreary and, you know, all blood, guts, and gore and all these horrible statistics. Um, I do try to make it a lot of fun. It is a full eight hour class, which when you're asking people to sit in a class for eight hours, and if anybody's ever taken a CPR or first aid class, eh, four, three to four hours. This is full eight hours, you know, so I got to keep everybody awake. I got to keep it interactive, you know, and I got to make it worth you spending an entire day with me um, and have you walk away feeling like you accomplished something. Obviously, it is something that you're going to get out of it as much as you put into it, you know, and I say that as, you know, I love questions. I love having nurses and EMTs and firefighters and all of that in my class because, believe it or not, the things that I teach are not things that they actually always get in their training. Um, if they haven't been, you know, responding to motorcycle accidents or if, you know, most tr uh, traffic accidents are involve cars, you know, and that's what they see. And most of the training they get is about vehicles. They are not getting the mechanisms of injury that they, that they're going to see in a motorcycle accident. They're not getting the helmet removal, you know, the why, when, and how. Um, so I have this coming class, I have a class on this Sunday, and I have three EMTs that are volunteer firefighters slash EMTs in rural areas that are coming to my class so that they can learn all these things that I'm super excited because it just increases the knowledge of everybody else in the class because they ask great questions they add to it so um this is for everybody it's for lay people it's for you know medical personnel it's for anybody who rides a bike um the second thing is that's just the basic class there's also an advanced class um that i'll be starting because i just started the business uh in march so i had to have a pool of people, you know, to come in to start doing advanced, but there's an advanced class. So once you've taken the uh, basic class, the advanced class is much more advanced and we uh, go into uh, oral pharyngeal airways and uh, chest seals and, you know, uh, eviscerations. So it's, it's very much um, something that any person can take and gain something out of. Um, I get nurses that come through and say, well, I'm a nurse, I know what to do. And I'm like, but what kind of nurse are you? Because you might be a nurse, but if you're a oncology nurse, you're not getting trauma. If you're a you know, L&D nurse, you're not getting trauma. So um, even like I said, even my EMTs and firefighters, so I've had a few doctors most of them have been like ophthalmologists, op ophthalmologists and proctologists, but, you know, I've had a few doctors. Um, again, you know, we are a very, very small portion of all the vehicles out on the road, but we're making up almost a fifth of all the fatalities. So um, it's super important to, you know, not just have this training, but again, like I said, I also teach uh, basic writer and advanced writer training. So training is important, no matter how much or how long you think you've been writing or how much time you have, right? Training is depreciative. If you don't use it, you lose it. And that goes for CPR, first aid, trauma, you know, that's why, you know, everybody has to take CPR class every two years, because unless you're a nurse and you're using it every day, learning it once and never using it, you're, you're not going to know what to do when that happens. Uh, this class is as well a two-year CERT, and, you know, you take it again in two years, um, because like I said, if you don't use it, you will lose it, and that goes the same thing with any kind of advanced motorcycle training. Um, that is a big part. I had the opportunity to be able to uh, train with our local police department with their motor um, patrol and get all of those slow skill maneuvers and, you know, advanced braking and turning and stopping and obstacle avoidance and all of that. And I practice those skills once a month. Every month I go out and I practice those skills because if I don't, 
they do depreciate. And I found that out before Ladies in Leather that Deb and I went to because I was teaching an advanced skills class there. And I hadn't, it's been so damn hot in Texas over the summer. I had not been going out and practicing them. And when I set things up so that I could kind of go through with what I was going to teach, it took me a minute to get all my skills back up. So I know that they depreciate. So um, if nothing else, if you guys can walk away with at least two things, and that is being prepared, right? Doesn't take anything away if nothing happens. Not being prepared and something happens can be tragic, right? So if nothing else, be prepared. My slogan for my company is knowledge is power because the more you know, the better things are gonna turn out no matter what, and that goes across the board, all right? And practice, practice, practice on your bike. Never ever take it for granted that just because you took a class 20 years ago that you know what you're doing. So I think that's all I have to say right now. I hope there's some questions. If there is one thing that you could tell this group in the event of an accident, like the number one thing that you need to do first thing off the bike, what is the first thing you need to do when you come up on an accident? Um, the very first thing is assessment. Find out how bad they are hurt. That is the first thing. Obviously, EMS, call EMS. Call EMS. Um, don't move somebody. Never take anything out of anybody and never put anything in anybody. Those are my two roles. Don't, don't take anything out of anybody. Don't put anything into anybody, right? And assess. You're going to do your uh, circulation, airway, breathing type deal. Um, obviously, airway, they're both just as important. If somebody's not breathing, but they're spurting blood out of an artery, you're going to probably going to have to take care of that arterial bleed before you start with the airway. So uh, recommendations have changed that instead of ABC, it's CAB and CAB where you're doing for trauma, it's, it's kind of going to be circulation, airway, breathing. So the big thing, once you get off that bike, uh, make sure every, make sure you're safe, make sure everybody else is safe, assess the situation, call 911. So yeah. Deb, do you remember? Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead, Jip. Go ahead, Jip. You're good. I was going to say, Deb, do you remember the PACT? Prevent further injury, assess the situation, contact EMS, and then treat the injured. And that is what I teach. Those are how it goes. So prevent further injury is about making sure you and the bikes are out of the road and cars aren't going to be able to come and hit you because if you get hurt, you're not going to be able to help anybody else, right? Assess the situation, figure out what you need, you know, that kind of thing, contact EMS. Those are kind of all happening simultaneously, obviously, and then treating, treating the injury. So that is the way the course is broken up into those PACTs. And I'll double down on the make sure you're safe before you help anybody else. I don't know if you guys saw that I posted a friend of mine who was hit after he pulled over on the side of the road, right? He ended up hospitalized in a coma for three days because he pulled over yep. on the side of the road. So that's why we start with down. prevent that further injury. You have to be safe before you can help anybody else. You are road furniture. Yes. Who else has questions? Usually, usually it takes one person to ask a question and then everybody's got questions. Scott Nelson always has questions. Next, next question. Tom Dine. Let, let, let's say that you do come across and you've done your assessment and there is bleeding. What would be the best thing to do? Would that be like apply a compress? You always want to start, yes. Yeah. So you always want to start from least to most, right? So, you know, when you're doing that assessment, obviously, if there is blood spurting, spurting out with the heartbeat, right? Um, you're going to want to try to stop that. The way you do that is, yes, is compression. If you can stop it with compression, then you just keep adding on top. You never lift up to look, right? You just keep adding on top and holding pressure. If it just keeps bleeding through, that's when you're going to start adding a tourniquet to that. Tourniquets can only be used on extremities. It can't go on the neck. It can't go around <laughs> the waist. It can only be used on extremities. So if that bleed is somewhere that's not on an extremity, it's on the belly, if it's on the chest, if it's on, you know, something like that, you're just going to apply pressure. The biggest thing we're going to ask you all, do you carry a trauma kit? First aid kit. 
Nope. There are two different things. I carry both. Deb carries both now, right? They are two separate things and they should be carried separately, right? Because you do not want to pull out your first aid kit and be trying to rummage through it to find your stuff in a trauma situation. And you don't want to pull out your trauma kit and rummage through that when you're trying to find an aspirin for your friend or a Band-Aid right? They should be two separate things, right? The ones that I have are about yay big. I, don't, I wish I'd have kept one in here so that I could show you. Um, it is very compact. Do you have your step? It's very compact. I have a bike without saddlebags. So it has to go into my swing arm bag along with my first aid kit. My first aid kit is in a brown roll bag because you don't need nothing fancy. <laughs> <laughs> and your trauma kit don't have to be fancy. I carried my trauma kit in a crown roll bag and I had them in two different colors. One was green and one was the purple. So I knew which was which. And that's the big thing. Have them, have them in two different colors. That way, if you're the first one off your bike, you can yell to somebody, hey, grab the blue bag in my right saddle bag. That's your trauma kit. And you know it. And you don't, you'll know. That's the big thing about the trauma kits that, um, that I have everything in them, everything in them. When you take my class, you get to touch and play with. I teach you how to use. Where Rory, do you find I mean, the trauma you said, kit? You said that you got yours, Rory, on the Guardian site, right? On the Road Guardian site? That, that was a yes, I bought. I bought a full blown uh, trauma first aid kit from the Guardians. From the Before Road Guardians? Yeah, before we went, Jerry and I went to Alaska. Awesome, awesome. Like I said, uh, that's Vicki. She sells them as well. Um, I have the ones that I use um, that, that I make up. They're specific to, like she makes up hers pretty much the same way I do mine. I don't recommend buying one off Amazon. If you don't have to, go to a reputable site, whether it's Recon Medical or TAC Medical or something like that. Don't do Amazon. Number one, those tourniquets are made in China. And if the, if the buckle fails or the windlass fails, it's useless. So don't buy a $5 tourniquet off of uh, Amazon. That's not good. You don't necessarily have to have a North American Rescue Cat tourniquet. Um, the ones that I provide, because they're expensive, they're almost $30 just for the tourniquet, right? So I recommend the Recon Gen 4 tourniquets. I, my son is a combat medic um, for the Army. Uh, he is also, now he's in reserves and he teaches combat medicine out of Fort Jackson. He's also a paramedic. So he got me started carrying tourniquets years ago before I ever started, knew about this class or anything like that because he said the only time he's ever used a tourniquet outside of a combat situation was a motorcycle accident that he responded to. So I sent him the recon tourniquets and said, do your best. Tell me if these are good. I had read all, Again, all the research, all the evidence, all of that, but he's a cat tourniquet guy because he's military. So I said, gave it to him and I was like, do your best, take it to your training, see if you can break it. He actually came back to me kind of like, damn it, mom. He's like, yeah, for civilian use, these are, these are fine. These are fine. He goes, I'm still going to carry a cat. And I was like, you do you, but I am trying to get people to carry a trauma kit and make it economical for them to buy it so that they will carry it. Because if you look on, trauma kits can be upwards to $100, $150. I sell mine for 60. You know, I'm not making any money off of them at all. I just want you to carry one. That's all I want. And yeah, I so want you to know, know how to use it. What's your, what's your website where we can buy them? I had posted the one from the Guardians. It is TX Trauma lifesaver.com i am crap i should have had like little stuff to send you like that but oh, got, i got uh, you i got yeah. you <laughs> um and i also have a facebook that is the same thing it's a uh, tx trauma <laughs> lifesaver um but it's no it isn't it's it's texas trauma and lifesaver on but deb can give you that she's on the website <laughs> <laughs> Um, but you can contact me, you know, for anything. Um, if you have any questions about anything, you don't have to buy mine. I, I don't care. 
you know, just make sure that when you buy one, you know how to use everything in it, right? I don't want you getting one that has needle compression and then y'all trying to do needle compression on the side of the road. That's not cool, you know? <laughs> um, I do talk a lot in my class about the Good Samaritan law because people always have questions about the legalities of doing something wrong, you know? Am I gonna get sued? Um, we live in Texas, so this is the question I ask for people in Texas. This may not go over as well for everybody there, but I always ask people if they are um, licensed to carry, like gun, gun carriers, whether it's concealed weapons or licensed to carry. A lot of my people are. They had to take a class, and in that class, it tells them, right, that if they remove their firearm, even if it is complete self-defense, be prepared to get arrested, right? You got to be prepared for that. So we live in a day or an age where anybody can sue anybody for any reason whatsoever. But the Good Samaritan laws do protect you. They protect you. That person can sue you in civil suit. And it, it, I mean, until the judge hears it, it is what it is. But that Good Samaritan law protects you as long as you were doing what you were supposed to be doing in good faith. That includes me. And that includes EMTs and firefighters, because I always get them to ask that, said, you know, what if we're doing something outside of our scope of practice? And I'm like, as long as I'm not trying to freaking do surgery on the side of the road, because that would be out of my scope of practice, right? As long as I am trying to save somebody within the best of my knowledge with good faith, I have no worries whatsoever. So... Just make sure that if you're going to get that trauma kit, please know what's in it, know how to use it, and know how to use it properly so that you don't further injure somebody. But you're not going to get sued if you do. You know, that's what I'm saying, as long as you're in good faith. Now, if you walk up to them and decide you're putting the tourniquet around their neck because you don't like gym, that may be a problem, you know, or if you go up to them and decide to kick them in the head before you start treating them because he was messing with your wife, that may be a problem, <laughs> you know, but as long as you're doing everything in good faith, you're fine. Where Any other questions? Find, where do you find that you, you see the most um, severe accidents? What, in, under what circumstances? Um, obviously, your most severe accidents are going to be in your urban settings where other vehicles are involved. Your single motorcycle accident in an urban setting, I mean, in a, in a, a, yeah, in an urban setting where it's just they ran off the road or a dog ran out in front of them or, you know, they took the curve too fast is not usually quite as severe, but the problem is it takes longer for EMS to get there. So it makes it, you know, that fatality, uh, you know, could happen just because of the length of time. But the um, number one, most of us know the number one reason for uh, motorcycle accidents, alcohol. It's the number one reason. It is alcohol involved. The number two reason, right, is that dreaded left freaking turn <laughs> where that car pulls out in front of you because they didn't look twice. Um, so those are the, the two major things. Uh, Cars versus motorcycle accidents are always going to be more severe than a single motorcycle accident on their own for speed or alcohol. So um, I don't get into the helmet debate because Texas uh, is a um, right to choose state. So I don't get into that debate, but helmets do um, decrease uh, morbidity and mortality by over 40%. So please wear a brain bucket if you want to, but this is America. You got a right to be an idiot. <laughs> a quick, quick story, if, you, if I can, about uh, turning left. Uh, I was on a ride with my wife on the back of the bike on a road that I know like the back of my hand. And I had a zone coming up where I could pass a car. The dotted line was in my lane. And, and this is a mountain road up above Lake Tahoe. And I pulled out to pass the car, so I'm accelerating. He turns left to do a U-turn on the highway, turning left in front of me as I'm trying to pass. Anyway, I hit the brakes. He didn't signal. I saw his brake lights. I hit the brakes, went to the right. My uh, left front of the bike hit his right rear, 
Uh, my wife and I did not go down, no injuries, but it sure pissed me off. And scary. And it's yeah, scary. scary. Every time that happens, it's scary. Um, unfortunately, I have been, I've been writing since I was able to put my feet over, <laughs> put my leg over a bike. Um, I had a motorcycle before I had a car. So um, I've got 20, 30, well, I don't even want to say how long I have, then you'll be able to guess. No, <laughs> but I've got a long time riding and I have been in my fair share of um, accidents. Some of them have been my fault. Some of them have been other people's fault. I have lost respect for my motorcycle and my abilities um, on the Blue Ridge Parkway. I went down, I was going too fast for conditions and uh, laid it down. That was totally my fault. And I had last summer, um, I had a 17 year old kid just totally, I was pulling out. He had his headlights off at night, young driver, didn't realize he had to turn them on, you know, and I didn't see him as I was pulling out of a McDonald's and he T-boned me and I broke eight ribs. So um, we choose to do a very dangerous hobby. Um, statistically, it is very dangerous. We choose to do that. And I still do it. And I see this all the time, right? The best thing that we can do is be trained, be prepared, be trained, be vigilant, um, do the things that all of y'all are doing, you know, you. get involved in your safety coalitions, you know, help change the laws for, um, you know, things that are dangerous to motorcyclists, get people aware that we're out there and who we are and that we're all of us. You know, we're not a bunch of uh, hoodlums running around that we're moms, teachers, doctors, nurses, you know, med whatever. So that's that's the big thing is getting involved in your motorcycle community. Well, I would say always expect the unexpected. And if you're in the foothills or the mountains or open range, especially after dark, beware of livestock and wild animals. Absolutely. Absolutely. And really what you just said, always expect the unexpected. And that's what I am trying to get people to take my class for, to carry a trauma kit. Like I said, it hurts nothing to be prepared. Nothing. Hurts nothing to be prepared, right? The minute you're not prepared and something happens, that's when it becomes the issue. But it does, it hurts nothing to be prepared. Gypsy, I had a personal question. Yes, ma'am. Um, I, re I recently switched from riding two wheels to three. Um, my husband and I, well, I just recently retired. He retired two and a half years ago. And uh, because of his issues, it was harder for him for me to ride on the back. And sure. I don't do a lot of long trips. So we switched and I bought, um, as my retirement gift, a tri-glide. But um, mm -hmm. should I seriously consider taking a, a trike class? Yes, because yes, here's absolutely. The deal. When I'm riding it solo, um, when I'm riding it solo, I'm totally comfortable on the bike. When I have him on the back, and you're talking about 225 pounds on the back, he thinks I can't feel him. Well, he is wrong. <laughs> um, and I need to be able to figure out how to adjust to that additional weight that's on the back of that bike. Would the class help me with that? Yes, absolutely. Um, so you already had your motorcycle license when you got the tri-glide. So you have not taken one of the three-wheel classes. Um, there are several places that offer three-wheel classes. And, and the biggest reason I know about this this is because one of my best girlfriends, Riker, um, when I say went to, okay, she was riding on the back of her husband's bike. They had an accident. She decided that she wanted control of her own. So she got a Riker. She didn't want to do two wheels. And um, she took the three wheel class. And I went up there and talked to the instructor um, after, you know, she finished. And yes, it would absolutely, because the three wheeler handles differently, it maneuvers differently, and they do go through some of those kinds of scenarios. So I would definitely say it would be worth it for you to take it. Um, the other thing is, is that you're just as vulnerable as a two wheel bike. As far as like, you don't have anything around you, you don't have airbags, you, you may not drop it, quote unquote, 
but you're just as vulnerable. So please, please consider taking a trauma class as well, um, wherever your area is and that kind of deal. So that if something happens or if you're writing in a group and something happens to one of your friends, you'll know what to do. All right, awesome, thank you. You're welcome. I, I think what she said, Dottie, is when you're riding with the motorcycling Rotarians. <laughs> so have. let me tell you, when I started all of this, I made every one of my friends take the class for me. And they're like, why, we got you. And I was like, yeah, but it's up to you guys to save me. Who's gonna save me if That's I go down? Fair. That's perfectly fair. I, so I was a combat lifesaver in the army too. And really all that me, I, I jokingly say it's really a combat death prolonger. That's all that is. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, um, but yeah, even you take it, Amanda, because like yeah, I said, right. even though you were a combat medic, you if you don't use it, you lose it. And yeah. things change, and you it's know? Been, it's been a couple of years since I got out of the army. Right. Things change, you know, evidence changes. And, you know, when's the last time you actually had to apply a tourniquet or wrap somebody up, you know? I actually, I actually never had to do any of it in combat. The only, uh, the only thing I ever did was give a lot of IVs to a lot of people who drank too much when we were in Colorado. Springs. Yeah, a lot of IVs and a lot of Motrin called the doctor tomorrow. <laughs> Good. <laughs> what other questions do we have for Gypsy? quiet group tonight. I don't, I don't know. She's, uh, Some, she's sometimes you can go through a military channel and you can get a hard shell first aid kit on like the bottom or the right side for a small first aid area. And then the left side might have the different size gauze pads and ointments and bandages and yep. adhesive tape and so forth. Yeah, the, uh, the first aid kit I carry most definitely was acquired, marauded perhaps from my army truck, and it has my army truck's name on it. <laughs> that's my that's my mi mi five in the in the saddlebag of my uh, of my scout. Oh, you see that here. I like it. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, it definitely. I need to go through it because I'm sure there's some uh, there's some uh, stuff in there from. 1994 that probably needs to be replaced. I think we yeah. might have lost Gypsy. It looks that yeah. way. It looked like she froze, so maybe she'll mm -hmm. try and come back. I, I usually blame it on me, but I figured everybody else was still moving, so it wasn't me this time. Has, uh, has anybody in this group ever been put in that situation where you've come up on an accident or you've been in an accident yourself and had to render first aid in a trauma situation? Mm -hmm. Pretty fortunate. It's pretty fortunate for us. That's good. It's, is that kind of like, you know, if you bring an umbrella, it won't, it won't rain, right? Everybody's got their trauma kit and their first aid kit in their bag, so they haven't had to use it. I've actually had to do CPR on somebody. Oh, no. She didn't make it, but it wasn't because of me. When I had my accident, when I went down, talk about like really strange moments. I actually went down in front of a police officer, uh, actually two police officers, uh, I, an off-duty nurse, an off-duty paramedic. So it was very strange because people are jumping out of cars, rendering aid, and you know they're like, "It's okay, I'm I'm an off-duty nurse," and I'm like, "Okay, this is really strange." <laughs> okay, I mean that's like, that's like wrong place, right time, right there. Yeah, really. <laughs> you know, realistically, yeah, it was uh, it was definitely interesting. But uh, uh, Penny, for those uh, for those, there are a couple people that I see here that are I in Texas. Um, I know uh, Penny is going to be giving classes. Um, most of them are towards the central Texas area. She's actually out of Georgetown, but um, we have been working with her to get more classes here in the Houston area as well. And I cannot encourage people enough to uh, sign up for the class. It's well worth your time to understand even some, something as crazy as if you're in a situation where you have to remove a helmet, because that is one of the things that she trains on. And, um, you know, a lot of times, I, you know, it was kind of scary, actually, you know, being the person who got to lie on the ground while people are pulling your helmet off, which is a very surreal feeling. Um, it was, it was definitely an interesting class. So I want to take a second since we're at I Oh, go ahead. Deb, I recently posted on your, um, page, uh, that, uh, 
to, if you have old helmets, that you should donate them to your firefighters, your EMS in, in your local area for them to train on. And it turned out, you know, since we recently retired and we moved to the country, it turned out that they were getting ready to have a training class and were well excited about receiving those helmets that I had that were, I'm not going to tell you how old they were, but they were too old for us to be wearing anymore. <laughs> so Actually, that's just something that people should think about. Oh yeah, definitely. I was going to say Penny, she was just telling me, I remember this post on, um, on my group that um, donating old helmets to e your local EMSs and things like that for them to use for training purposes. And I think it's, it is a spectacular idea. And I think it's a fabulous idea. I'm going to say, we talk I, about I how, old, how old they, they should be when they're replaced. <laughs> Five years. Five years. Good job. Well, <laughs> if, if they're, if they're dropped, if they're dropped from over, you know, three foot, like if they're, you know, if they're higher than the seat of your motorcycle and they get dropped on the ground, you should really consider replacing them. You don't know what the styrofoam on the inside, right, has been cracked. The other thing is don't leave them in your hot garage because that styrofoam on the inside shrinks over time. The reason for five years is for that same idea is that the styrofoam in there, when you have your sweat and your head is hot and all of that, that styrofoam shrinks and it decreases the ability for that to absorb the impact. So um, it's another thing we talk about in our class. The, the styrofoam, you gotta have quite an impact for the styrofoam to crack, but you, any drop like that, has a lot of micro cracks in the shell there itself. You go. And yep. that's very dangerous all by itself. Thank you. Sorry about me like leaving and coming back. It's storming here and I live in an RV with uh, Wi Fi. So <laughs> it's wireless Wi Fi. So when it storms and the towers move, I'm like, oh crap. <laughs> oh, good. We're glad we got you back. We were, uh, this is Vicki. And, and now I'm getting the connection on stage. <laughs> Hi, Vicki. Hi. Uh, I'm a little distracted because we had to stop and get propane and it was a, uh, a cluster. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I was, who was thinking about taking the uh, tri guide class. Uh, I've had a trike for 11, 12 years now. I just got a, uh, a new one because mine kind of died on this trip. But, uh, you know, I just figured that, you know, you can't, like you said, everybody has said, you can't know too much or practice too much. And, you know, it's just crazy out there. You have to assume everybody's uh, going to do something stupid in front of you. <laughs> so you want to know how to respond. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like I said, you know, a lot of people switch over to the three-wheelers and they've already had a M class. And so they don't think about taking one of the three well classes and they can be very beneficial because that's a different ride. You know, um, the handling, the stopping, you know, all of that is different than two wheels. So I think it'd be very beneficial for anybody who went from two wheels to three wheels to take that class. Yeah, uh, and actually mine, the one that, uh... I lost on this trip just a few months ago was like a 99 Road King Lehman conversion. So now I've got an 18 Triglide. So it's a lot different, a lot better, but still, you know, uh, there's stuff to learn. Well, again, like I said, knowledge is power. Hey, Rory, did you have a comment? Oh, okay, <laughs> just checking. Hey, Deb, did you find the trauma pack that you got from me? All right, wait, hold on. I went to pick it up and this guy. Yes. Oh, so it comes in a nice little, nice little case for you. So you can see like the wound. Yep, that's the, that's the emergency trauma bandage or Israeli bandage. Let's see. Yeah. All right, we had, I don't know if you can see it well, but. Little, little pack, little pack little pack in there and then I believe my tourniquets in here and my scissors yes 
the magic scissors. And the matchy, yeah, the matchy, yeah, I'm, I'm cute matchy. The emergency blanket. Yep. Which is yes. not just for covering people up. No, it is and, not. <laughs> compression gauze. Compression gauze. And then everybody's favorite, the CPR face shield. Yes. It was, it was, uh, it was worth it. it. It's worth it to take the time to take the class. I, I am encouraging a lot of people to do so here. Um, unfortunately, in the last couple months, we've had some really, really bad, bad accidents. And um, especially in our sport bike community, um, just, just some accidents that I'm not going to say they could have been avoidable, but speed was obviously um, an issue. Um, and we really, um, unfortunately, the younger generation wants to videotape everything. And so the most upsetting part about it was actually seeing video of the accident and then what happened afterward. And I can tell you, we had a guy that they were moving. I, I watched them move the guy around in a field. And there was no reason that anybody should have been touching him. I mean, it was, yeah. it was bad and he was, he was severely injured. And that has kind of put a push on our community in general to start, you know, getting people educated, you know, and it, it's, it's an important, it's, I think it's an important skill set to, you know, push out there. It for sure is. And, you know, Penny, Penny, I'm going to look at Larry. So actually, so I'm the, I'm the regional director for the International Fellowship of Motorcycle and Rotarians for the Northeastern region, but Larry is the president. We are going to get as many people as we can to ride down to Houston in June for the Rotary International Convention. So maybe it's something that we can talk about to see if we can get together and do a class. And it absolutely would be nice to bring non-riders in, right, to just kind of get some awareness from the non oh, absolutely. I've actually had a couple of non-writers and they took my class because they were active um, uh, firearms instructors and they wanted the trauma part for because it, it definitely equates. It equates to, you know, gunshot wounds, to car accidents, to, you know, you cut yourself with a knife or, you know, something, something like that. It equates all the way around. Um, if you want to do something like that, Larry and Amanda, um, I do, I am developing a um, blended class, which would be um, four hours of it online. You take the didactic part online and then do the skills part in a four hour session so that you wouldn't have to take a full eight hour day. And I'm doing that for groups like this. Um, I'm looking at hopefully uh, Deb doing something like that for the Hoka Hay writers, you know, um, that kind of deal. So that I'm just a big fan of in-person classes. Um, I think you get more out of it when you get that interaction and all of that. This is a way to kind of have it, you know, so that just the regular didactic part you can do online and then I can do just skills training. And of course, the ulterior motive, there, it's all part of getting you familiar with Rotary, talking to you to join in. <laughs> all right let's, i don't know a lot about it i'll have to be honest <laughs> a little bit so, um, i should have started with that so you, you, you say you don't know anything about rotary i don't know a lot no i don't i like to steal a thing like from it's a i think it's climate change stuff where it's like think uh, think globally but act locally it's very much that way where we we do a lot of um, a lot of fundraising for things like polio eradication for saving mothers and children supporting education growing local economies worldwide but then obviously we always push to do some local tangible visible things as well right fundraising through uh, and, and things like that where you know rotary has come together and, and seen a need in the community and, and fulfilled that need our club is different we are every day trying to find cool new ways to be able to give back to our community that happens to be national international which is different um mickey schaller michaela schaller there actually just coordinated where we planted three trees down at the uh Wheels Through Time Museum in Maggie Valley, North Carolina. I love that place. We, we tried to plant three trees. <laughs> We're eventually going to plant three trees. 
<laughs> but you know, so we, we, um, we really do like, we think globally and act locally. I, I like to steal that one um, because it's way better than anything I could come up with, but yeah, so, you know, that's, that's kind of who we are. It's not, it's, I'm sure it's not approved elevator speech from rotary, but uh, other people can do it better. Um, yeah, but we're motorcyclists. We don't really do the approved. <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah, five second sound bite before I get out of range, right? Yeah. So that's who we are, right? And I, I do welcome you at any point in time if you'd like to join us again for a meeting, especially if we happen to have a, a speaker who's going to speak with something more uh, rotary focused, like Rotary Foundation or something like that. But anytime you would like to. So I'm, I'm kind of uh, throwing up the, I'm, I'm playing the Emmy music in the background here because we're five minutes from closing. Um, but I want to say thank you, Penny Gypsy, very much for joining us tonight. You're um, welcome. This is recorded. If you ever want to grab it on YouTube, show it to anybody else, happy to let you do that. Especially since, like I said, ulterior motive, everybody finds out. What there you go. Is. Other people know. <laughs> um, Deb, thank you very much for inviting Gypsy tonight. And I'm assuming you also had something to do with Dottie, Michelle, Vicky, and there was one more. Shannon was here. There was a Shannon at one point. Shannon well. who joined us as guests tonight as well. So, um, so on that vein, we do like to end our meetings with what is called the four-way test of the things we think, say, and do. And then I like to go somebody who's completely unexpected, uh, unexpecting of this, like Quinn, and say, Quinn, would you like to join us in Rotary's four-way, or lead us in the four-way test to end our meeting? Absolutely, I do. In the way we, of the things we think, say, or do, first, is it the truth? Second, is it fair to all concerned? Third, will it build goodwill and better friendships? Four, will it be beneficial, be beneficial to all concerned? All concerned. Yeah. Do you guys have a five? Yes. Is it fun? It's really fun. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's what we do at Ryla. We say, is it fun? But um, in my Rotary Club, we have another one too. <laughs> What's that? Ours is, will Delisa find out? <laughs> <laughs> I think ours might have been, will Jerry find out when I was here? <laughs> <laughs> Again. Penny Gypsy, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Um, I do welcome everybody. I encourage everybody to hit those links and go learn a little bit more about what she's got up. And uh, Larry, I'll be in touch about potentially putting something together for, uh, for our- Thank you guys. Please send me okay. any questions, email me, whatever you need, and I will get back to you. Appreciate it. All right, all, we do have a board meeting. So if you're a board member, please stick around. If you're not a board member and you'd like to stick around, you are welcome to do so. But I'm going to hit stop recording so there's no evidence. Thank <laughs> you all. Take care. I'm going to stick around just.